I think this is truly uh, an iconic product. What this particular lure represents to me is not only the, the creativity and the innovation of making it out of plastic, then putting the cross hatching, then putting the metalizing, but then the, also the creativity of, of this lure and the next lure and the next lure and the next lure and it just, it just seemed like it just kind of you know, went on forever. But here we are literally a half a century down the road from when this lure was originally created. And this is still one of the top selling lures in the world. There are lots of lure designers, there are lots of lure companies, but this, this lure is recognized all over the world and, 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 and has, you know, ever since 1963. It's pretty amazing. Retro bassin, kicking some ass in wearing rayon jackets. Thinking about bill dance, watching these fish prance through my Ray-Ban glasses. Ain't nothing better than 40-year-old lures coming off of Zepco 33. Out on the bass boat, making beer cans float, doing some trespassing. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassin. Crack open your tackle box, your dad's tackle box, or your dad's dad's tackle box. And I bet my bait cast that lurking somewhere within is a lure created by one man. When he first developed and then later produced the amazing Swimming Minnow in 1963, George Perrin Sr. chose not to name the lure company after himself like some of his less than bashful fishing contemporaries, but instead chose the name Rebel Lures. It's been reported that in the second year of production, the Amazing Swimming Minnow sold over half a million units. And who knows how many millions, if not billions of fish have been caught on Rebel Lures since then. Yet as well known as Rebel Lures is today, there is much confusion, if not downright controversy, surrounding the production and release of many of the most iconic baits we know today. In fact, more than 60 years later, many questions still remain. For example, was Plastics Research and Development started as a lure company? How exactly were iconic lures like the Amazing Swimming Minnow and the Pop R designed? And lastly, who actually designed all those lures? Well, today in the first of a special two-part series of the Retro Bassin Show, dedicated to the roots of Rebel Lures, we sit down with George Buddy Perrin Jr. to talk about his late father's fishing legacy. When we recently caught up with Buddy at his home in Tallahassee, Florida, he informed us he's actually not sat down for an official interview in over 40 years. Well, hopefully you enjoy this mini-series as much as I did filming it, but for now we're going to turn this over to Buddy Perrin, who's going to tell us all about his family's fishing legacy, as well as his father's obsession with catching more and bigger fish through plastics, research, and development. My dad, uh, George Perrin Sr., I'm, I'm George Perrin Jr., he was a very, very passionate outdoorsman. We heard stories from my grandmother. She'd put a bucket of water in a stool out in the backyard and, and he would sit on a stool and he'd fish in this bucket of water, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure the validity of that story, but, but you know, knowing that, it, you know, it's probably true. But uh, he, was a, he was an avid outdoorsman and I've seen pictures of him when, you know, when he was a teenager and he was holding up, you know, you know 12 pound, you know, bass. But uh, he fished. He, he always fished. He, he loved it. He was a hard man to fish with. And it was because we were growing up and, you know, we were 
six and eight and ten and twelve and and you know we would we would go out and we would spend all day in the boat with dad while he was fishing it, it didn't matter what the weather was or what time of year it was he would be in a short sleeve shirt in the boat in december fishing and I'd be in the front of the boat and he'd be running across the lake at about 40 miles an hour. And, you know, it was, you know, a 40, 40 below wind chill, you know, and I, and I, you know, I would shiver so hard I couldn't even hold a rod. And, and you know, and, and he'd just, he'd fish and he'd fish. We would fish all day, all day, hot, cold. He never carried food. He never carried anything to drink. He might have had an ice chest to maybe throw a couple of fish in, you know, if it was what he wanted to keep. There was no picnic basket in Dad's boat. There was just tackle boxes and, and rods. I'd, you know, stick my hands in the water, you know, and start, you know, hitting the water and all that kind of stuff, you know, and then he'd, you know, he'd whack me on the top of the head with his, you know, rod tip, tell me to be quiet. But the thing that drove me crazy was we would fish all day long and he'd go, ah, uh, okay, I guess it's, you know, time to go. And he'd crank up the motor and we'd start out across the lake, you know, on the way back. And then all of a sudden he'd go, ah, uh, let's try this place. And then he'd pull, <laughs> and he'd stop. And he'd just, you know, he'd fish and he'd fish, you know, and I'm in the boat just going, oh, you know, please just, take me home you know and it, 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 he did it every time every time on the way in he'd just he'd go oh that, you know let's stop here you know let's try this and it just you know it was just you know i didn't think i would ever get home and then of course the next day you know we'd you know he'd wake me up at four o'clock in the morning and we'd you know do it all over again but uh it was uh it was it was it was quite a quite an experience he was probably and of course, you know, obviously I'm, I'm biased and prejudiced, but uh, I think he was probably one of the best fishermen, you know, ever. I mean, he just, it was the love of his life. Uh, he just, he did it all the time. And, and I think that, I think that's a dynamic you, you can also add in, 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 into, you know, rebel lures. It, it was, it was the passion of, 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 what he liked to do and, and rebel was just a, a by a byproduct of that uh, i think it would be hard you know to be a lure designer and and not be you know fanatic about fishing but he was just he was just crazy about it he loved it he had this one little characteristic and uh, i've never seen it uh anywhere else uh, he's the only one i've ever seen do that yeah he had a he had a crooked tooth right down here at, the, at his bottom tooth. And when he, when he put his, his bottom teeth with his top teeth, it created the, the perfect cutting mechanism for monofilament line. In the process of working his prototypes, he would, he would cut and tie a lure different lures, same lure, changed it or whatever, 40, 50 times. And every time that he would change a lure, he would just, he'd just, he'd just bite it. And all I had to do, just, he'd just bite it. And he would just cut the monofilament. It didn't matter if it was 12 pound, you know, 20 pound, it, 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 it just, he'd cut it with his teeth. And so what resulted from that and this is kind of a uh, kind of a neat thing for me. Um, Dad kept a lot of his prototypes. I've got them. Um, I have a box that's full of original prototypes. It would be a finished lure, or it'd be an unfinished lure, and he would do different things to them. And and I'll show you some of the different things that he would do. And um, each time that he would work with a prototype, uh, he would he would make a change or he'd do something to it, and then he'd just he'd bite it off, and then, then he'd just throw it in the bottom of the boat. So at the end of the day, you know, he might have 
you know, I don't know, you know, 20 or 30 prototypes laying in the bottom of the boat. Well, he would, he'd put them in a box. He would just gather them up and he'd put them in a the box and, and then just, you know, do the process just over and over again. So over the years, um, I had a box full of his original prototypes and nobody's ever seen them. Uh, they were in that box for almost 50 years. There's a misconception about Rebel Lures and where it actually started and how it started. I think you have to go back a lot earlier than what people think because dad was dealing with plastics back in the late 50s. And so the company that dad had uh, was a sewing operation where there were just dozens and dozens of women that all day long, all they did was just sew name tags onto the soldiers' uniforms. And uh, even uh, uh, Elvis Presley, uh, he, he was there uh, at the time that Elvis, Elvis Presley came through. And so he came up with the idea that instead of sewing the names uh, of the recruits onto every piece of clothing that they had, uh, you could do a little plastic molded nameplate that had a, had a bobby pin on it. And so every time they changed a shirt or a jacket or a uniform, they would just take it off one garment and put it on the next one. And that way you didn't have to sew all of the names on every piece of clothing that you know a, a service person had. That's how he got started in plastic injection molding. And that evolved into Plastics Research and Development Corporation, which was about 1960. Uh, it was just him and about three other people. And so Plastics Research developed into what was one of the largest uh, injection molding companies in the Southwest. They were making plastic parts for uh, the auto industry, motor shrouds. They were doing plastic parts for GE refrigerators and Frederick air conditioning. So they were a large specialty molder. So Plastics Research was, was already a pretty good size going concerned when dad turned his attention uh, to, to making lures. In 1962, I remember I was 10 years old. I remember dad uh, sitting at the dinner table at night and he would be carving uh, prototypes out of you know wood or, or you know sometimes he'd, he'd carve them out of soap. So the creation of, of Revolure started in, in 62, well after you know Plastics Research had already been in existence. The thing about what dad did with his, his creation of the Revolure, at that time the the most popular lure that's ever been created was was the Rapala, um, not the Rapala, as as it's often called in the United States. But uh, as uh, anyone in in the fishing industry knows, Lori Rapala created the original swimming minnow back in the 1940s. The problem that Rapala had at the time that dad was starting to think about rebel lures was that the Rapala minnow, uh, it was made in Finland, so it had to be imported into the United States. They were handmade, so they, they were uh, very limited uh, production. As a matter of fact, I think uh, in, in 1962, 1963, uh, the annual uh, production for Rapala was around 5,000 lures a year. So they were e e extremely limited in their production. So that made them very hard to find. You, could, you, you couldn't find them in the United States. If you did, they were very expensive. Uh, stories about, you know, marinas and tackle shops, you know, actually renting, renting them out. But there were some, some structural problems with Rapala in that they were hand carved. So that means they were asymmetrical. Uh, it was it was hard to to get each one identical, uh, made out of balsa wood, which was extremely fragile, and they had a tendency not not to to run true. 
So you could uh, uh, you could take a, a rapala, and if you weren't careful, if you threw it up on the bank or it hit a rock, uh, it'd break. And then that was it. You couldn't find another one, and and you were out of you know a pretty good sum of money. So when Dad had the the idea of of making a swimming minnow out of plastic, uh, the plastic that he used was was uh, ABS. And, and it's, it's uh, very, very durable, very strong. You can't break it. With uh, plastic injection molding, especially with, a, with a, a fishing lure, like the swimming minnow. So when you mold it, you mold uh, two sides that are identical, and then you put the two, two halves together to create the lure. And the process is you mold the lure, you, you glue the halves together, and then uh, the halves go into the metalizer and, I, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. And then it's painted and the hooks are put in, the lips are, are put on. And so every rebel lure is identical and they're all completely symmetrical. So right out of the box, they run true. They're practically indestructible. Uh, as, as it's well known, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got lures up here that are 50, 60 years old. So, you know, they, they can literally last a, a lifetime. But uh, one of the things that, that truly changed the industry is at that time in the early 60s, just about every fishing tackle manufacturer was creating product that was made out of, of wood. Uh, th there were some early plastic lures, but they were, they were very odd. They were almost like a plastic cork. Uh, it, it, it would be, you know, something round, you know, that had a hook attached to it. The thing that, that changed the industry with the creation of Rebel Lures was three things. One was the material it was made out of, which was plastic, which, you know, the characteristics, like I said, you could make them, you know, identical. Uh, indestructible. But Dad had two innovations uh, that he created in development of the original uh, Rebel Minnow. Uh, the first one was cross-hatching. And if you'll notice on just about every Rebel lure, there, there is a, is a cross-hatching on the side of, of, of each lure. And what that does is it acts as the, uh, the mechanism for the metallizing, which is a process where the, the, the lure bodies are put into a, a vacuum metallizer. And inside that vacuum metallizer is a little small uh, aluminum strip, and you pull a vacuum in that metallizing chamber and then when you heat that aluminum strip up, uh, it just it explodes and it just coats everything that's inside the, uh, the vacuum chamber. So that's how you, you, you get the metal finish on the Rebel Lure. Well, when you add that metalized finish over that cross hatching, whenever that lure moves in the water, it has that light ref reflection. And that had never been done before. And you can really only do it with plastic because you can mold it into, you know, the actual body. So I think the, if you think about Rebel Lure, you really have to think about the cross-hatching uh, creation, the innovation, and the, and the metalizing innovation because that's, that's really what made it what it was. And, of course, that literally changed lure design and lure development from that point on. So now you had uh, a lure that was stable in its characteristics. Uh, each one would run true right out of the box. It had a metalized finish that wouldn't, you know, flake off. It wasn't paint. The lures were painted. They had the backs of them were painted. They had the eyes uh, painted. And then uh, they had the, the plastic lip in, in, the, in the hooks. But the thing that revolutionized the 
fishing tackle industry, specifically Rebel. Going back to the Rapala story where they could produce 5,000 Rapalas in, in a year. Rebel started production in May of 1963. So the design part of the Rebel occurred, you know, in, in 62, leading up to the, to the spring of 63. That's when I would watch Dad carve out all of these prototypes. So in 1963, when they started production, they already had, and they started out with just one, one design. It was, it was the, the F series, the F10. And there were, uh, there were four sizes, but uh, only three main sizes, three and a half, four and a half, and five and a half. And they came in two colors. It was a metalized gold finish or a metalized silver finish. In May of 1963, they already had orders for 100,000 lures before they even started production. And once they were into production that spring, they were making 6,000 to 10,000 lures a day. So the impact of that in the, in the fishing industry was just phenomenal because you, you you could find a rebel lure, you know, just anywhere. Uh, they're readily available. Uh, the, the high production numbers, you know, kept the cost down. Plus, you, you know, you got a, a quality product. And it was, it was just stunning to, to look at the numbers th that was happening with the with the production of the the rebel in in 1963 and 1964 in 1965 a little over a year and a half after they had been in production they had already made uh, over a million dollars in revenue just in, in by 19 in 1965 alone so they were they were producing over a million lures a year um, it was it was just phenomenal and I think that that's a real testament to the product itself you know the uh, the the creativity that went along with the utility of it you know being plastic and all the characteristics you know that that came along with that that it was a, a product that was readily available it was uh, uh, you know really creative had new innovations to it that that lures up until that time didn't have and so the success of, of rebel lure was was just phenomenal if you if you think about the creativity part of it a lot of people don't really know about this because they they didn't have you know the uh, the inside scoop of, of what was going on with the with the creativity of of the lure design when Dad would design lures. He tried to come out with uh, a new design about every six months, and so there was a there was a ton of, of of research that went into you know designing a new lure. Um, one of the one of the ways that he would do his R and D, and and I, I got to see all of that up close and personal because I was in the boat with him. Um, we would go to uh, Lake Washita, which was just a couple hours outside of Fort Smith. That's where Plastics Research is located. Uh, there was uh, a place there in uh, Mount Ida. It, it's called Mountain Harbor Lodge and Resort. It was founded and, and owned by Hal Barnes and, and his son, Bill Barnes. And they had a swimming pool there at the resort. And that's where we would go on the weekends when you know he could get away. And that's where he did a lot of his uh, R&D. Uh, we would spend it uh, out on the lake, of course, but it was kind of, you know, a funny story in the early days when, you know, people were in the restaurant at the lodge and they were, you know, looking out over the swimming pool and uh, dad would be standing on the diving board just, just endlessly just casting, you know, lures into the swimming pool, watching the action, uh, tuning it, uh, you know, changing things, you know, changing hooks, changing lips, uh, you know, changing the eyelet. 
uh, changing, uh, you know, rod weights, you know, uh, changing different lines. It, it just was just an, an endless process of, of R&D. And of course, from a personal standpoint, uh, I'd be in the boat with him and, you know, we would leave out you know, uh, you know, before daybreak and we didn't come back <laughs> until it was dark. And so, you know, I, I got to set, you know, many, many hours watching, watching him fish and, 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 you know, develop and, and create these, these lures. And it was, it was, a it was a pretty amazing thing to witness, uh, because, well, you know, first of all, there was a, there was a lot of creativity going on. And, and, and you got to see that. Uh, I, I can't even tell you how many tackle boxes Dad had. And they would have paint in them. They would have all of the, the different hooks, uh, different eyelets, different lips, all kinds of things that he could experiment and, and change and work with as, as, you know, as we'd fish. And I'd just sit in the boat and I'd just watch him and he would, you know, he'd take a lure out of a, uh, out of a tackle box. And uh, a lot of times they were just bone, which is just the plain, un unpainted, uh, unfinished lure. And, uh, and he would you know, pull some paint out of a tackle box and he would change the color or he would do different colors and, you know, iridescence and, and just dots and, and he would just endlessly experiment he was um you know the the real dominant uh creator of of most of those lure designs and uh, i got i got to watch him you know carve a few of them up but but then later on you know as as you know we moved out of the the 60s you know when i was uh in junior high and high school and then later on in college you know every every summer uh you know i would spend you know working either in the lure plant or in the in the tool and die shop and then later on you know in the 70s you know we can go into the the boat phase you know i was working in the boat plant there while, while i was in college but it was it was just um an amazing thing to witness uh when you were in the plant in in one summer and then you were in school and then you'd come back the next summer and there there were more lures that you know had been created you know that were in production you know the creativity just just was you know continuous through there and of course plastics research um just it exploded you know, as, as, as a company. Um, I think at the end of 1965, uh, they had over 100 employees. Um, so that was just in, in two years' time. And I think they, they built on to the, to the original plant three times within that two years just to, you know, expand the production. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassoon.